What's up, gangsters? How about a little 3D printing action? The first little bit of, of, of news, or whatever you want to call it, though, is that I had some drama with my printer itself. So I've got a video clip recorded uh, on my iPhone about how that went. Um, and then I've got a little video clip that I recorded on my iPhone about some hacks that I made for my printer after I got past the drama that you're about to see. So anyway, let's get into that and then we'll take a look at some parts. Okay, so here I am with my wonderful assistant, Emily. Say hi, Emily. Hello. We are putting the little EPAX X1 4K back together this morning because I had another failure. I had a power outage a couple of days ago that was about 10 seconds. And when I came in, the print that I had running had quit, and the uh, LCD screen was dead as a stone, just like the last time, well, the last machine failure I had. But what I discovered was, see the UPS back there behind the machine, was that it was plugged into the not surge protected side of the UPS. So I was afraid that the machine had fried itself, but I got on the uh, got on uh, uh, with the support guys. Uh, Dan uh, at Epax was fantastic. We actually ended up doing a video chat. Uh, they put me on a Google Meet, and uh, so he was able to look at the machine via video and walk me through taking it apart and getting in there. And the crazy thing is that uh, when we uh, laid it over and opened it up and then turned it on to check that it was getting power. Not only did it have power, but the LCD screen was back in action. No, no explanation. Uh, and so we ran a uh, screen print test and it ran fine. So who knows what's up. The only weird thing was that in order to get the VAT out of the machine, we had to manually cycle the lead screw, which you can just turn it. You know, if you've got you've got good fingers, you can just spin it, and that raised the build plate. We got the vat out. Maybe that triggered something in its little brain and brought it back to life. We don't really know, but sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. It was, uh, yeah, a close call. Uh, maybe I'm going to run another build tonight, and we'll see what happens. But hopefully everything will be well that ends well. Okay, so here's a couple of little hacks that I've incorporated I thought I'd show you guys. One thing is that um, this uh, Epax X1 4K shipped with some pretty small thumb screws for the VAT. And, and you know, it just wasn't really easy for me to get my clumsy thumb and finger on those. So I asked them about it and they actually have these with the larger head and I ordered them from from them uh, from their website for like five bucks, had them like a week later and they are much better. The other thing that was a little bit difficult for me, um, and I, you know, one of the reasons that I bought this machine is because I love the flip top cover, but because of the way it's designed, the uh, screw that holds down the build plate is a little bit hard for me to get my fingers on and it was just you know a hassle so I just whipped up this little wrench in Fusion 360 and now it's basically just like a little you know quick turn thing that's all it takes is about uh, three quarters of a turn and then I just snug it up like that and works great 3d printers printing parts for themselves Another little thing I've been doing is I bought off of Amazon uh, a bag of like a hundred of these cheap brushes. And these are really nice for uh, stirring up the vat if it's been sitting, uh, if, you know, if your resin's been sitting for a few days and the pigment has settled to the bottom. It's also real good to just do a quick sweep after each print. Just, you know, run the brush around in the resin real quick just to make sure that you don't have any little bits of trash that fell off that you didn't see. So you can, that way you can run a clean cycle before you screw something up. So anyway, just a couple of quick little hacks that have made my 3D printing life easier.
Okay, so once I got back in action and got to printing again, everything was going pretty well. And so I've got just a few parts that I wanted to show you guys. I think I may have showed you these before, but over here on my workbench, where I've been working on these uh, ordinances for my Ming 148 scale Hornet, I've got some parts that I've printed. Some of them are already painted up and ready to go. Those right there are the tails for my GBU-54 bombs that I uh, designed in Fusion 360 and printed. It took me a couple tries to get those where I wanted them. Um, the panel lines for this little door thing right here were a little too small at first. Just wouldn't show up with a, you know, with a panel line wash. But I made those, uh, ended up making those be about 0.2 millimeters wide. And it looked kind of grotesque in the CAD model, but it printed out perfectly. And as you can see, really did take a wash nicely. Then over here, I've got the actual warheads for the bombs. I've got them textured up with some Mr. Surfacer 500 to provide that uh, uh, coating that, uh, that they kind of spackle on there to uh, make it where they're like uh, thermally protected when they carry them on board ships. So that's why they look kind of nubbly and they're getting ready for some more paint. And then I've got the actual seeker heads over here. Uh, that's the little part that goes on the nose. You can just sort of barely see those. Anyway, so that's all been going pretty good. Then I decided that I wanted to print some of these. <laughs> these are super cute. These little astronauts are something that I saw on Instagram on Roman Lapat's page. If you're not familiar with him, um, I believe he's in Germany, but he's a really amazing figure painter. And he was doing this thing, I think it might have even been a contest, where um, uh, people were creating stuff with these little bitty astronauts that he had made up, especially for this deal. And he was doing these where he was doing like one a day or one a week or something. And he would paint one of these little things up and put, put it in a, a unique scenario. And they were all just super cool and super humorous. You can see the fat little astronaut. But it's only 15 millimeters tall. And it printed wonderfully. Um, and I printed uh, printed. each of the... I, bought, I, I should say, the reason that I can print these is because... Roman made them available, made the STL files available on his Etsy page for about eight bucks. So I bought them and they are, they're just fun. Now they come uh, supported already, which is kind of a good news, bad news thing. I think he did a pretty good job of it. Um, you can see how he supported this one. But... Um, even though he did a good job of it, and I think he made the you know made the right decisions, it means that if you want to scale it up, like I did, that those supports and that plate that they're on, raft, whatever you want to call it, are going to get pretty thick. And you can see that that is in fact the case here because I scaled this one up 300% to about the size where maybe I stand a chance of painting it well. And you can see, this one was run, um, those, were, those were run at uh, 10 microns. This one was run at 20 microns. It's Craftsman Gray, which is what I, all I use anymore. Um, and I have anti-aliasing turned on to the highest level, which is 16. And this has got a nice layer of Mr. Surfacer 1500 on it, but you can see the uh, surface finish is really, really good. There's some flurm in there from painting, but the surface finish really is nice. I mean, it's it's about as smooth as I've ever seen a print. So I'm looking forward to doing a little doing a little cleanup sanding and and uh, getting that thing print painted. But you can see what I mean about the supports. They are extremely thick. But you'll notice he used these ball ended supports, which is kind of cool. I'd never seen that before, and they're kind of nice because if you just break them, they tend to break at the joint down below. And that leaves just a little ball attached to the subject, which means then that you can go back and clean those up more delicately. So it's kind of cool. I may uh, start using some of those myself. Um, the other thing that I printed today, and this is uh, just another example of why I say over and over and over again that there are no rules for positioning, okay? Like you can see this one is uh, leaned back at, I don't know, that's like... What, what is that? 
well let's let's compare it to this little grid thing here on my workbench that is a 30 degree angle and so I'm gonna say that's about 45 that he's leaning back there and you can see it did great I mean there's very little in the way of of artifacts from the layer lines but you know again with a round surface like this there's always going to be something where you've got that potential um, and I think the anti-aliasing did a really good job of taking care of that but there's a few places where you can see a little bit of evidence at any rate these parts okay I just arbitrarily angled them about uh, you know like what I normally do which I tilt them like 30 degrees in one direction and maybe 15 or 30 degrees in the other direction. And that's been a pretty good compromise between build time and uh, surface finish and resolution. And these I also ran with anti-aliasing on uh, 16 because there wasn't any fine detail I needed to care about. Um, these are parts for a kind of a little fixture thing. I'm going to put magnets in them and it's going to be kind of a stacked up rack that I will be able to hang these uh, ordinances on for photography because they all have magnets in every one of the pylons. You can see right there. So I've got a little pocket here for the, uh, for the magnet to go in. And uh, so it doesn't have to be real precise, but it can't be that fucked up. <laughs> That is supposed to be a rectangle, not a trapezoid. Not at all. And you can see over here on this side, it's pretty, pretty screwed up too. Not good. Not good at all. Um, you know, so again, you can see that probably what happened is that just because of the forces involved between the build plate and the FEP, that it just started to, started to stretch some of these layers out. I mean, who knows? But... Again, it printed pretty good, but I mean, at least in terms of surface finish, the surface finish is phenomenal. But that is just not acceptable, even though they actually do. They, they distorted enough um, in both the male and the female feature that they still mate together really nicely. But it's not going to work because this is going to plug into a base that has this same rectangular socket and it's going to be printed at a different orientation and it will be more rectangular or maybe less i don't know anyway these ended up being the wrong size anyway i need to uh, change the dimensions on some other parts of it so no big deal i'm just gonna i have to run them again anyway but i think that what i'm gonna do when i rerun them um, i can only fit three of them on the build plate uh, when I when I orient them like this and I could fit uh, all six of, of the ones that I need if I just do this and um, Or maybe I'll flip it up like maybe I'll flip it like this or like this I don't know, but it's gonna be I'll probably I'll probably go like this that way my supports that I've got under here will be on a non visible surface and I can just sand those flat but point being is, so yeah, it's going to take longer for the print to run, but because I'll be running twice as many parts, I'll end up being net less time than two prints of three parts oriented this way, and they'll at least hopefully be the correct shape. Okay, so I hope all that's useful for all you would-be 3D printers out there in the model-making world. Uh, as always, I appreciate you watching, and much love.